excitement during the week to sit us all. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here this morning, and I know Florence is, because <laughs> uh, she had a, had a narrow one. <laughs> I, uh, I trust that uh, the insurance company will do right by you and uh, put your house back together. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, well, we just finished up the, the lessons on uh, our journey into uh, Christ-likeness. You recall we talked about the, the fruit of the Spirit and how that's how we become Christ-like. Well, now we're going to talk about following Jesus. This uh, list of lessons this next 13 weeks is called uh, Journey into Following Jesus. And... Um, First lesson is entitled, Why God Can Use You. And He can. He could use the 12. He could use just about anybody based on what he's, what's, we know about them from the Scripture. Um, so uh, as we get acquainted uh, with the 12 disciples during this, uh, the course of this journey, uh, you may be surprised to discover one or more of them is very much like you are. Why is that, I suppose? Because there are personality types and people that fit into nice squares. Not everybody fits into the same square. Uh, the disciples remind us that the Lord uses very ordinary people, just like you and me, to do very extraordinary, extraordinary things. Jesus chooses them, about the 12 I'm talking about here, about a year uh, after his baptism in the Jordan River. I, I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, he had his disciples, you know. But when the Bible uses the word disciple, it's not necessarily the 12 they're talking about. There were disciples of John the Baptist. There were disciples of Jesus. There were people that were following him around, basically, because they were very excited about some of the wonderful miracles that he was performing. Um, but it was about a year after his baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. Uh, at, he had been performing miracles, preaching, traveling around uh, Galilee, and he had many followers. Uh, but he's not yet chosen that 12. Let's, uh, the, 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 to see the context of this, let's turn to Mark 2.23. Mark 2.23. And... Uh, We'll go through, uh, well, we'll read 23. Okay. So the Bible here in Mark says, And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples, okay, that's not talking about those 12, but it's talking about the people that were following him, uh, as they went, began to pluck ears off the corn, taking the wheat, and, so they could eat something, have a little snack along the way. Um, the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? Um, also, in Mark 3, 7, we see uh, the multitude following Jesus. Uh, but Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. So, um, people came from all over what we call the Palestine area now, uh, to hear and see uh, this great miracle worker and um, learn more about him, uh, again in Mark 3, 8, and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, they came to him and wanted to be part of this action. Um, there is a natural appeal, isn't there, to when, when great things, things that capture your imagination are going on, we have a, a tendency to go, want to go see, gawk, um, almost is uh, appropriate to say about that. You want to see what's, what all the, the hullabaloo is about. So the choosing of the 12 from this, his large body uh, of followers is recorded in uh, two Gospels, uh, in Mark 3 and uh, from 13 to 19. Let's, well, let's go ahead and read that since we're here in Mark 3. 
And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. So he's making specific selections. Just whom he would call, he was calling them. And they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have, a, have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he, sur, uh, he surnamed them Boanerges, which is, we, all, we know them as the sons of thunder. Uh, and Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the Canaanite, we come to the final named party, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. So that was the, the, in the Mark rendering of, of um, the calling out of the twelve. Uh, we'll turn to Luke 6. Mark Luke. Luke, sixth chapter, and verses 12 through 16. So, again, title 12, Apostles Chosen. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. This first time the word apostle is used in that reference. Um, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, or the Zealot, and Judas, the brother of James, and one more Judas, Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Scripture is very uh, good in pointing out to us who people are. Uh, like, uh, we're talking about this Judas, not that Judas. All right. Um, so, we see, as we just read in the Word, we see those, those ca called were Simon, whom he called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelot, the Zealot, and Judas the brother of James, Judas Iscariot as well. Um, that's quite a, an august group, the, with the uh, exception of Judas Iscariot. So the, who was the first listed? Simon. Peter. And the last was Judas Iscariot. So the, the first and the last. The twelve had very, very diverse personalities and political views. They did. That, that was, the political views really caused them problems as they were misunderstanding a lot of what Christ was saying and what he was doing uh, throughout his ministry. Matthew was a tax collector who sold out to the Roman government and collected taxes for them. Simon the Zealot, he was a fierce Jewish patriot. He was trained in the use of basically a form of martial arts and how to use weapons that were easy to conceal. Um, hmm. He was ready to give his life to free Israel from Roman domination. They were polar opposites, these men. Um, politically, which shows our Lord is great enough to pr transform and use, uh, I don't know, Democrats or Republicans or even independents. Um, that's pretty impressive. So, so when, we're, when we're down in the mouth about, well, do you hear what those Democrats are saying or those Republicans are saying? Or why can't the independent fellow have an opinion? Uh, it's no different then than it is now. As we get to know the 12 disciples, we will discover that there were four characteristics that reveal why God can use them and can use you and me. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this point, if, 
you know, the introduction. Father, we uh, come to you again. Lord, just uh, so grateful to be uh, here uh, to study your word, to have this place that we can be unafraid and not accosted by the world uh, as to what we're teaching and what we're believing. Lord, we just ask now that you would open our hearts and minds, give us ears, Lord, that we can hear your word and hear how it's speaking directly to each one of us as individuals' hearts. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, first characteristic about the disciples. Think about what their, what their occupations were. They were very, very ordinary people. Nothing that made them stand out. Anybody, nobody was going to say, well, you know, someday that Peter guy is going to be pretty famous. You know, or that, that uh, Matthew, I really, really appreciate what he's done for the Romans. No, people weren't doing that. Um, but he was just, a, again, just a, a guy that had a niche and he had an ability and he used that mathematical ability to gain favor with uh, the masters, the people that had dominion over the, uh, the, the, the land at that time. So through the centuries, the 12 apostles and the, the disciples have been portrayed as saints. They are saints but much different from us. That's how they were portrayed. They have been immortalized in stained glass windows where they are shown floating in the air in all of their, their glory. Now, this is not what they would have done, but this is what's been done um, to their the people, that, to the likenesses of them. They had halos over their heads. But they, those disciples, those 12, were no different than you and me. The disciples were real. They were average. They were normal people with the same temperaments, weaknesses, and fears as all of us. Not one of them would have ever been thought of as doing something great or becoming famous. They were just plain old everyday group of them were fishermen and, uh, uh, and other uh, uh, trades. Uh, none of them had great talents, intellectual abilities, or great influence. What's it usually take to have influence? Wealth, yes. Uh, when Peter and John, the most prominent among the twelve, preached before the Sanhedrin, the members, the members of the Sanhedrin are astonished when they see Peter and John's boldness. Let's turn to Acts 4.13. That's where this happens, when they go and preach before the Sanhedrin. Acts 4. Acts 4.13. Here the Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. Why did they marvel? Because they took knowledge of them. They said, yeah, these guys, they were the ones that were walking around with Jesus. Well, Jesus was an impressive man, clearly a man of intellect and knowledge, and which, again, for a Galilean uh, carpenter was... Uh, Pretty impressive stuff, the way he could uh, manipulate and, and, and talk through uh, God's word. God usually finds his choice servants in the ranks of ordinary, ordinary people, like you and me. He does use the highly educated. Can you name a highly educated apostle? One that comes first to my mind is Paul. He's not a, a direct appointment, but he did become an apostle because he did see Jesus and Jesus taught him uh, when he was in, the, in Saudi Arabia or in Arabia. Um, but Paul was very, very highly educated in the world uh, way. Uh, the wealthy, like Abraham and Job, those are two pretty wealthy guys. And, and even sometimes the powerful comes to mind to me is King David. And King Solomon. 
God mightily used those men, um, and they're great examples for us in the Bible as a result of that. But most often, he just uses plain old everyday you and me, and uh, that's pretty cool. God usually calls those who are not wise men after the flesh, mighty or, or even noblemen. He, he's not normally using those kinds of people. He most often chooses the foolish and the weak and the despised. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 28. 1 Corinthians 1. And read verses 26 to 28. And we see here, in the, the Bible says, For ye see your calling, brethren, now that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, nor not many noble are called. Hmm. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And in the 28th verse, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught, not N-O-U-G-H-T, uh, uh, things that are, okay? The first not was N-O-T. Naught was the one to bring to naught was N-O-U-G-H-T, meaning no out, that's not a good, out, uh, the best outcome. Um, so, um, in other words, God mostly calls plain, ordinary, everyday people like you and me to do extraordinary things. And that's explained in the next verse uh, where we're at here, and that's uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and verse 29. And why does he do it that way? That no flesh should glory in his presence. So we, there's no glory outside of the glory of God that's worth anything. We, we are, are, we're all vanity. We're vainglorious. And it, it's, you know, you may say, the, well, the football player has great glory on the field. It's, it's, it's just fleeting. It's gone in a wisp. How many people remember the guy that scored the last-minute touchdown 45 years ago? It's really, it's gone. It's not lasting. What God glorifies is glorified forever. Um, so, we should uh, be mindful of that. There was nothing about any of the 12 to make everyone think, well, that's a distinguished group of fellows. Uh, and if you know, if you read about them and what they did, well, uh, they were with the Lord. Um, my goodness, the Lord was patient. <laughs> he was really patient with them. In every way, though, they were just ordinary people not unlike us. Second point, another characteristic. They were young. You know, the oldest one of them was mid-20s at the most. That was Peter. And the rest of them, I mean, John was in his teens still. Um, and he's the two most distinguished of the disciples are Peter and John. Um, but there was the oldest and the youngest that were called for that purpose. They weren't old, mature, or experienced. They were very young, probably most in their early 20s. Uh, like I just mentioned, John was in his late teens, and he was the youngest. And Peter, being the oldest, was in his mid-20s. One thing we must never forget is the young, the people that we look at now and say, well, that young, foolish young person, you know, they will soon take over the ministry. They will soon take over the very country and the very world we live in. So they need to be, they need to, uh, be trusted and trained. We also must realize as we get older, we get into ruts. In many ways, we become more foolish uh, because of that rut that we're in. Um, and our worship can become very routine, very dry, matter-of-factly. The older we get, the less we like new methods. You ever notice that? Uh, in fact, the Air Force was so hard over on this. Uh, we got we to gotta prepare the way for change. Change had to teach us classes that taught us that change is good. 
Now, I've done a lot of changes in the last several years that I would take contention with the term that that change was good because what are they doing? They're bringing in transgendered people. They're paying for them to have gender-affirming medical care. The military is doing that right now, and, and it's, it's just wrong. We, that's not something that should be happening, but I digress. So um, we become more resistant to changes in methods and ideas because we don't like change. We're comfortable. However, young people are full of enthusiasm and new ideas. Oh, let's try it. This, it's never been tried. Well, trust me. Uh, I take you to Ecclesiastes, and I give you the first, the, uh, the, the first exhibit. Everything is vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. Not one thing. You think it's new? It's new only because it's new to you, not to humanity as a, as a group. But we are supposed to be, uh, I mean, think, think about it this way. The, the Jews were in a rut called the, uh, they were in the law, and they had various uh, factions, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, etc., that were dominant in the political world because they had the law. And they, they purported, they, they said they were keeping the law. But we know that that wasn't possible. They didn't keep the law. They were just, it was effrontery. Um, so, we who are older should heed this admonition from Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12. Let's go over there quickly. 1 Timothy 4.12. I really enjoy the book of Timothy. It's good stuff. Four and twelve. One. Now, when you know it, I would grab two pages instead of one. All right. So uh, here the Bible says, "Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit." in faith, and in, impu and in purity. Well, what does that mean then? Well, this means that older believers should be very sensitive to the views and ideas of younger believers. We not only need to lead them, we need to heed them uh, when at all possible. Younger believers should be encouraged to take places of service and leadership in our churches. So as we study the 12 disciples, we continue to see uh, that we need to remember they were ordinary people and that they were young. Now, the third characteristic of the 12 is they were often, this is, I know this is going to shock you, but they were often very disappointing to their Lord <laughs> because they would, when he's trying to make a point about something, what are they doing? Well, I wonder who's going to be on the right hand and who's going to be on the left and uh, how many crowns are you going to have and how many crowns am I going to have? You know, it's, they were, they were, that shows their humanity and their, and their, uh, uh, their natures. The Gospels clearly reveal the imperfections and weaknesses of the Twelve. Who often disappoint our Lord? For example, the disciples personally hear Jesus teach about faith and see him demonstrate his power through many miracles. Then one day, after a series of miracles, including the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, let's turn to Matthew 8, 14 to 15 here for a second. This is the place where uh, Peter's mother-in-law is healed. Matthew 8. Yeah, almost there. And 14 and 15. Here we see the Bible says, And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. Now, that, that's, uh, I find that very interesting. She, she needed to take care of these, these disciples that were coming in. And that's, the Lord healed her. That was an act of mercy, of course. Um, and when the even was come, they brought in, unto him 
many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with, this, with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias, the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So... I always keep turning an extra page. So when they departed from that place, they went out and got on a boat. And uh, what's the first thing the Lord does when he gets on board? Well, he goes to sleep. <laughs> he goes to sleep, and that's in Luke uh, 8, 24. If we want to turn over there. Uh, But it shows you, really, these men have been with him for a while now. Um, and they still don't understand um, why they should not have their common everyday fears. Um, and, and they should have complete faith in the Lord. But uh, as Jesus goes to sleep, what happens? A violent storm arises. Much like uh, what came about around here the other day. And it caused the waves to break over the boat. Now, April and I took a sailboat excursion on Flathead Lake on Thursday. And we went out. It was calm. The lake was flat. We're putting out there under the diesel engine's power on the sailboat. We finally get out into the deeper water and out in the middle of the lake. And we head over to where we can see there's ruffles on the water because that's where the wind's at. And, and I never had that great appreciation for the vastness of, like, the Sea of Galilee. Now, Flathead Lake is a, is, you know, a huge lake. And, in fact, I don't even know, I don't know how large lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee is, but I don't think it's as big, nearly as big as Flathead Lake. But it gives you a sense, though, to be out there. And as we were out and we were sailing, of course, we started tacking and catching the wind and, and using the wind blowing the opposite direction to go the direction we wanted to go. That was pretty cool. And uh, so what I'm saying here is this. I didn't have the appreciation for what, when the wind started to change and the wind started getting higher, we had to head back to shore. And we had something that the, the uh, disciples didn't have on their little boat. We had a motor. <laughs> and it made it possible for us to be able to, Cut through all the the uh, the swells and the uh, and the changing winds, and we could put away the sails and take down the drag, and the little motor just pulled us right on through. But um, I can appreciate what it was like to have that storm come up. And oh, by the way, the Lord's asleep over here. <laughs> um, the disciples wake Jesus up and they tell him, "We're we're going to perish." We're about to drown, which causes the rage. And Jesus immediately gets up, and what's he do? He doesn't just say, he just say, he rebukes the wind. <laughs> Stop it, you know. And um, I think that's pretty impressive, which causes the raging waters and the storm to subside with a great calm, an immediate calm. Uh, again, in, in uh, Luke 824, let's turn, turn there real quick, uh, and we'll see what uh, specifically it says. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and they were calm. Huh. But then what does Jesus ask the disciples? In the 25th verse, he says, And he said unto them, Where is your faith? I mean, you've got the Lord God of the universe sleeping on this little boat with them, and they're terrified because they're going to die. Uh, so, and they, bring, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man? So they didn't even understand this yet, just what manner of man Jesus was. They saw him doing these miracles, but they were still blind to who he actually was. For he commandeth even the winds and water. And the thing that really stunned them is, and they obey him. That sounds a lot like 
the Lord God of the universe. <laughs> they think you're able to do that. Later, as the time approaches for his crucifixion, now going jumping forward in time with the disciples, Jesus very resolutely heads for Jerusalem. So when Jesus and the twelve come to a village in Samaria, the villagers let it be known Jesus and his disciples are not welcome there. As a result, according to Luke 9, 54, what did James and John ask the Lord? So that's Luke 9 and the 54th verse. Okay, here the Bible says, And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them <laughs> like he did the sea. Um, this is not exactly a demonstration of the love and forgiveness that Jesus had been teaching about either. Uh, as we read, read earlier, Jesus calls James and John the, th the sons of thunder in Mark 3.17 because he is aware of their hot tempers and impatience. At the Last Supper, just hours before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus is te teaching the twelve about his suffering and death. He serves them fruit of the vine and bread, which represents his blood and body. However, at this moment, what does Luke 22, 24 tell us? Luke 22, 24. And it says there, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? So these are truly just human beings. As Jesus is teaching them about his cross, they are arguing about crowns. Moreover, the night before Jesus' crucifixion, all the disciples boast they will never deny him. Yet at his arrest, they all desert him. <laughs> and Peter later denies the Lord. Then on the first Sunday morning, after Jesus is crucified, the women return from the empty tomb to tell the disciples about Jesus' resurrection. And in Luke 24, 24 11, quickly turn there. Luke 24, 11. We find the disciples' response. And their words, the, the women's words, seemed to them as idle tales. And they believed them not. Now here's these Women are telling them, hey, this, we were just there, he's not there, and we were told by this angel that he's risen. Wow. So when studying the disciples, we need to remember they were ordinary, they were young, and they were often disappointing. The final characteristics is they were transformed. Our master takes these men who are diamonds in the rough with all their weaknesses and failures, and transforms them into the pillars of the church. We find this in Ephesians 2.20, and the, it's, the Bible says there, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, and then in Revelation 21.14, what is written on the 12 foundations that hold up the wall? The 14th verse says, And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So getting to know the 12 disciples should inspire us because if Jesus can use people like them, he can use you and me. He can use us because he can transform us just like he did the disciples. A legend says that the angel Gabriel meets Jesus in heaven as he arrives after his ascension. This is all fable. He asks Jesus about his work on earth, and Jesus tells him, I have turned it over to my 12 disciples. Knowing what kind of men they are, the astonished Gabriel asks, 
What are your plans if they fail? Jesus replies, I have no other plans. Although this story is a legend, that was true then and is true now. If we don't do what Jesus has called us to do, who will? Who will? Jesus has not entrusted his ministry on earth to angels, but solely to you and me. How does Jesus express that truth in John 20, 21? Well, he says in the 21st verse, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has, hath sent me, even so send I you. And again in John 17, 18, we read, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So God can use you because he used the 12 disciples who were ordinary people, young, often disappointing, but were transformed by our Lord. Think about these characteristics this week and see which one you think most reveals why God can use you. Next Sunday, we will continue our journey into following Jesus with lesson two, becoming a great disciple. Thank you for your careful attention.